we have this itty bitty shaft and rotor assembly from a pavement recycling crusher to do some work on because it has a bearing retention groove as we call them in the industry and it's not really supposed to it's supposed to have a place where a bearing installs and comes off instead of a big old retention groove so none of our machines in here are really big enough to do this job um, I'll let you just think about it a little bit how we're gonna maybe do this um, it's 45 50 inches across somewhere in there I forget it's too big for our 32 inch lathe which would turn this if it was in the gap but we've only got this much that's a gap area so it ain't gonna turn it not getting any reading out here there it is a little bit in there it's supposed to be on a smooth surface there's a reading 24.9 so you know I don't know if I can. Huh. Just can't get it to bounce there. There it did. Yep. Yep, she's got some toughness all the way through, even where it had been annealed by the bearing. By the bearing spinning against it, which it also could get hardened if they watered it down right after it quit spinning while it was on fire <laughs> you don't ever ever know for sure what happens with it but uh yeah uh it's on the softish side of the 4140 that's hardened so we'll be using the 110 18. we won't use squishy rod over here on the end we have a place where Austin the Beaver took it, took it to town. And as you can see, there was a lot of bearing metal that was embedded in it and uh, took a lot to cut it out. And we're getting ready to uh, build it up. We'll stand this upright. And when we stand it upright, we will be working with the uh, stick. And people ask, why don't we use wire feed? And from what I've found on a job like this, when you're using wire feed, um, if everything was consistent, this was machined, and we had a way to turn it, we might save a little time with wire feed. But the thing I've found most of the time, you're going along with wire feed, everything's going good, and then something goes wrong, and it's back here, a ways away from where you realize that you're starting to get a few little bubbles, and it's just too fast. The stick you can work slow you can get a hundred percent of the quality of your metal and as a machinist you learn more about getting an x-ray quality weld than most welders not all but most welders ever do because after you weld this carefully you turn it back down you will see any time that you had a pit in there you will totally be looking at it layer by layer as you turn it back down and you'll remember what you did wrong, where you were thinking about something other than welding. You just have to be, don't even think about anything creative, don't think about petting your dog. You just have to get into the bead puddle and even how much of the metal runs a little one way or the other doesn't matter, but the puddle, the actual puddle has got to be clean 100% of the time while you're welding up something like this so that when you turn it back, it's all good metal. After building the weld up on this, we um, used an induction heater to heat up the welded area. Getting that nice and warm allows the stresses from the weld bead cooling to sort of normalize out. It helps minimize any pulling or bend that might occur as a result of building up that uh, big old welded area. Um, and there's a lot that can be said in a discussion on induction heating, so I've left this section 
relatively short, just showing the actual induction heating, and then there's a link in the description to a video where John gives an in-depth explanation on induction heating and how it works, etc. We've normalized this using our uh, heat treating, uh, well, our induction heater. You use the induction heating for whatever you want to. We've got a 60 kilowatt induction heater we used. So after all of the welding, we heated it up one last time, nice and hot to let all of the stresses from the welding to uh, stabilize out. Now we've got keyways in here and we're gonna take uh, where the keyways are. We're gonna make filler pieces for those so that we can put this on a roller stand we've got, roll it around and see if there's excessive bending in the end of the shaft that we're saving because we need to have this. Doesn't matter if it's straight in line with the body or not, the body is pretty crude and rough, but we want it to be in line with the stub shaft on the other side so that the pulley is not out here wobbling sideways as it rotates around. Um, it could actually move up and down a little bit, be out of center, and would not matter that much for this particular piece, but a lot of wobble is going to tear up their belts. Um, a little bit of wobble is going to be acceptable, but uh, we need to know what it is and see if we need to stand it back up, heat part of it, and straighten it out or not. And uh, that's, that's our next step on this project. Um, we're going to set this up on a stand so that we can see if this is out around. And uh, while we could on this side, we could actually put a roller here. There's a couple torch marks, but we could put a roller here. However, we'd be slightly on an angle and riding just on the sides of our roller. I'd rather go with the same diameter on both sides. And what we're doing here is we have cut a keyway with the proper radius on the top. Basically, we turned a piece of tubing so it had this size and we cut the keyway out of it. Now we've put the keyway in there and we're gonna measure how much more we need to go down so that it actually fits in the keyway and makes the shaft round in those places. After we get these pieces made correctly, we will put a hose clamp in two places to hold it in there while the rollers let it roll. And if you look at this side here, which is the one we're concerned about as far as the uh, straightness actually, um, and I, I do believe, just looking at it, that it is bent, but I want to know how much so we know which, how much to pull it which way. And this is the same diameter as that one. So this is the one we'd be using for our rollers to be straight instead of running on an angle. And uh, so we're going to do a key for this one here too. We're making them for both sides. And then we'll, yeah, then we'll have it up on the stand and roll it around, see how bad it is. And maybe we'll be surprised. Maybe it'll be straight. It doesn't look straight to me. Uh, whether it bent before we welded it or after is kind of irrelevant. It's, although I've been amazed how many times I've done things like this and not have them bent just from the, the welding. You can pull it, but you keep your welding pretty square. We did have a, it was bad. It was ugly. You saw the other pictures of it earlier. It was, it was ugly. So there's lots of reason why the welding might have pulled it. But just as likely, since it had been narrowed down to a very small section of shaft and that section was hot when this quit being used because the bearing had melted into it, it may have gotten bent from the fact of just operation as it was dying. Either way, we need to get it relatively straight and uh, these keys is, are part of that tooling. We got this set up on our stand. Um, we got it welded. We normalized it and now we had to check how far it is bent. And in six and a half inches, the bend run out is 120 thousandths. So we're about 260 thousandths that we will have for movement out here uh, back to where we're going to rebend it. Is we're going to assume whether it was from the bearings or from our welding that the bending happened in the weakest point, what was the weakest point of the shaft previously. So that's where we're going to bend it again. So we have our video that we've, uh, our video, we have our stand that we've made up here. Austin has done pretty good at making the stand. And what is this stand for? What is the whole structure of this? Our heating is going to be here in the middle of this, so we can heat this up with our induction coils. 
And then the stand up above, which, oh, it is, like I wanted it, nice and solid. You can rock it, and it'll actually rock the part. We have it built with uh, these 100 kilogram lifting magnets to hold it, and then we put indicators up on top of this, put regular indicator bases up here. But we have a major problem, which, uh, <clears throat> which is my fault. I hadn't thought about the proximity of these stands to the induction coils. As you see here, they're actually pretty close. So we really can't use this because it's going to move our indicator stand when the induction coil's on. So we're gonna go ahead and have a redesign on that. Well, we have the redesign. We're going to have a redo on part of the build and we're gonna bring each of these leg stands up st pretty much straight and uh, then over, although it's not gonna be as stout as the angle. This is definitely, any way we'd go about it, there are problems with, there's always problems, compromises. We don't want to just weld onto the part. We definitely need something with an indicator that floats out there to tell us where we're at. It's a problem, but that's our current quandary, and we're starting to get to the point where a customer's going to need his part pretty soon. So that, that is a problem. And there is an overall of what's going on. You can see the chain coming down and a rotating stand that's going to be used to pull on the shaft in different directions to allow us to uh, pull it. Okay, go ahead. We went a little more free form with the next design on this by using the clamps, but uh, yeah, I like this. I can wiggle it, get some movement, but it comes back real quick and it's not much movement. It's a good indicator stand. Austin was a little hesitant to ask me, can I just clamp it? Because he didn't want to go through making something fancy and bulgy again. And uh, it looked like it was going to work good. And yeah, it does. It does. We're still using our magnetic uh, bases on the bottom. And why don't we just, for kicks, let's try it in our alternate direction here real quick. Let's see how much wiggle we got there. <laughs> Because we only have one brace in that direction. And it does move more. It's not terrible, but it does move more. You can tell the difference when you've got just the one backer. That's that solid bar. That came off scraper. Tell them. Yep. I really know. Oh, that's seconds. And it don't mean anything because it doesn't really do what it says. And the three units go because